doubt. We all have it. But what do we do with it? Maybe you were raised as a Christian, but you haven't darkened the door of a church building in quite some time. Maybe you had a painful experience that makes trusting in God just seem so inadequate. Maybe you've read and studied your way out of and you feel like you've grown past religion and its claims. I want to invite you to join us on a journey as we ask the question, is faith credible? A meaningful faith is one that is worthy of our examination, our trust, and answers to the deepest longings of our heart. Skeptics, doubters, seekers are welcome as we ask this big question. We don't have all the answers, but we know the one who does. Join us on this walk as we search for a worthy faith. The next day, Moses took his place to judge the people. And people were standing before him all day long from morning to night. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what's going on here? Why are you doing all this and all by yourself, letting everybody line up before you from morning to night? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me with questions about God. Questions. It was a kindergarten uh, teacher who was teaching in Sunday school and said to a sweet little girl, what is the biblical commandment about how to treat your parents? And she said, honor your father and your mother. Very good, said the teacher. Is there a commandment about how to treat your brother? And she thought for a little while and said, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> it's a good one. Questions, questions, we all have them. Some people, their questions are fairly light, and they aren't a big deal in terms of their life of faith. And we call them Monica Christians. Augustine was a famous uh, Christian writer in the fourth century, and his mother was named Monica. And he writes in his book that his mother never really doubted. I mean, her life was always one of extreme confidence in the Lord. And when Augustine began to sow his wild oats, she's thinking, no worry, God will take care of this. And when he's telling her all the reasons why he's never going to be a Christian, she's thinking, that's fine, God will take care of this. And after lots of soul searching and studying everything he can get his hands on and arguing with everybody he can possibly argue with, one day he has a serious moment in which he gives his life to Christ and he begins to write huge, important books that have affected Western culture uh, and Christianity for a long, long time. And the whole time his mother's thinking, I knew this was going to happen. Monica Christians, also called summer Christians. Things seem to always be sunny and rosy for such people. There are such people in God's kingdom, and I am grateful for them. And then there's Augustine type quest Christians, the ones who have to ask why and have to go figure out why and have five objections to everything in order that they have to work their way out. I was the kind of person that every time I got a degree, I'd go to the next school, and the first day of school, I'm arguing with the teacher because what they're saying doesn't agree with what I was taught last year. And then when I graduate from that school, I go to another school, and now I'm saying, actually, I learned a whole lot at the last school, and now you're wrong because they taught me something that was better than what you're teaching me. And I'm the kind of person that changes my mind by kicking and screaming as I drag myself through because I don't like to give up something unless I've got a better reason to hold on to it. But I'm constantly questioning, questioning, questioning and saying, okay, why are you telling me that? Give me six reasons. Okay, that's good. Give me four more. Augustine Christians. And then there's winter Christians. Winter Christians are the kind who are Praying most of the time, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. It feels more like spiritual desert than spiritual plenty. And I don't know where you fit along that spectrum, but I want you to know the kingdom welcomes you. I believe there's a place for your questions. We're doing a series starting today. 
in which we're going to look at the worthiness of God, the worthiness of Christ, the one whom in Revelation is declared, you alone are worthy. If anything is worthy and worthy of praise, it's my God. But our questions linger. And in four weeks, the last lesson in this four-week series, I'm going to try to explain why this is and ought to be a safe place for your doubts. I, I do know that there are Christians who have incredible confidence. I've always loved Christian evidences or apologetics. So we're going to deal with some of that over the next four weeks. But I remember growing up, at least some of the people that I would listen to and learn from seemed overconfident and certain about everything. Then I lived a little bit of life, began to read some things, began to actually encounter people who think differently and find out things might not be as simple and cut and dry as I was hoping it would be. And I want you to know that Zephaniah says, I want you to seek humility. And in Mark 9, 24, we find out it's possible to have faith right in concert with lack of faith and still be somebody whom God will heal. There's room for humility and doubt in the life of faith. Read the Psalms where David's crying out to God, why, oh, why, oh, why? There's a place for that even when we're not exactly sure how to answer. I want you to know in four weeks, we're going to talk about why church should be a place for doubters to gather and express their doubts and to share their doubts. It's a safe place for your doubts. Don't have to have it all figured out. I certainly don't. In three weeks, we're going to look at the fact that this is a secure place for our examination. We're going to look at reasons why it is worthwhile to have faith in God and in the Christian system. It is a reasonable faith. If our God is true, we ought to be able to see reasons why that truth will stand up under examination. Next week, when we have all our friends here with us, we're going to look at how Christianity, faith in God, can answer our deepest longings, the things we want more than anything else. We find fulfillment in Christ. This is a loving place to talk about our longings. But this morning, I want to talk about our questions. This is a welcome place for them. I find that there are people who have inherited religion. And inherited religion is one of those scary things. Because it has to become your own for it to be something. And you'll find a lot of people with inherited religion will go through periods of serious doubt. I want you to know that's actually normal and often very healthy. But the questions, the questions can either drive you to a deeper faith and trust in God, or it can drive you away. But this is a welcome place for them. I know people who have left the faith because they've said, I couldn't find answers to my questions. And I've also known people who have left the faith because they've said, I didn't find faithful people, church people, people who wanted to hear my questions. But the New Testament tells us that God invites questions. I mean, we see this in Luke. Jesus sent 12 in the temple. Isn't just telling everybody you know, everything he knows. He's asking good questions. Christians are told to test the spirits to see if they're of God and only to hold on to things that are true and good. And we have this language we already read to you when Moses is judging the people. And why is he spending all his time out there? Because people have questions about God. I know you do. But I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you. Because for every one person I find who will tell me that they did everything they knew to do to try to figure out ways to resolve their questions but couldn't find them, I can think of two students or people I've interacted with who leave faith because of a series of YouTube videos or because they had one question, they asked one person, didn't get a satisfactory answer. And I want to say, spend a little bit more time than that because some of these questions do have reasonable answers and maybe not always certain answers, but I hope what I can do is to lay a foundation for why Christians are Christians. I don't pretend to know the answer to everything. 
But I do think that there are good questions, and then there are questions that have often been used in ways that are less credible than the way that people who use them think they are. I'll give you an example. I'll need you to turn the slides. I left my, I left them at the. You know what I'm saying. Reason question number one that often comes up is: well, Isn't religion outdated? I mean, after all, isn't religion in decline? I, I heard a report recently that said that Christians, especially in America, is on the way down. The, the rise of the nuns, the people who check none of the above on the census box, isn't that going up? Isn't it about 25% of the country now that says, I don't belong to any kind of organized religion? Besides, isn't it the case if you go down to any bookstore and you look at the bestseller list or you start listening to podcasts and you just start trying to figure out what's out there, you will find some biologists and you'll find some neuroscientists and you'll find some social historians who say we don't believe in God and we began to really make great breakthroughs in life when we broke ourselves free from the shackles of religion. This is how we were able to advance because religion just holds us down and good thing that it's both outdated and in decline. Hmm. You start asking for examples. Well, you know, back a long time ago, I guess we needed God to fill in the gaps. I mean, we didn't know how the water cycle worked, and so we needed a, a sun God, and we needed a, a water God. But now, now we know about the water cycle. We don't need God anymore. And we needed angels to push the planets, but now we know Kepler's law of planetary motion, so we don't actually need a God anymore. Interesting. You do know that the guy who in, discovered the water cycle, Bernard Plenacy, he he was a faithful Christian, and you do know that Kepler, Kepler's law of planetary motion, was a deeply religious man, full of faith, who believed he was finding harmony in the universe in keeping with the God that he served. That kind of story happens all through history. But that's beside the point. The Pew Research poll that came out in 2007, then again in 24 to say, that religion, for the most part, especially Christianity in America, looks like it's in decline. But then read the fine print. The number of people in America who said, this 35,000 people survey, who said they are absolutely confident, confident that God exists, went down by three percentage points from 93% to 89.5%. 89%. And then the next question was, are you absolutely certain that God exists? And that number went down, believe it or not, only 8%. And I think that number represents our understanding of what you mean by certainty just as much, if not more, than what we mean by God. And then you start asking about people who pray every day. And you ask about people who uh, attend services uh, out of a sense of meaning. And you will find that those numbers actually were insignificant in terms of margin of error. But I want you to think outside America for a second. Did you know that this morning there are more people worshiping God in China than in all of the gatherings of Christian people in Europe combined. Did you know that in 50 years, the number of believers in China has gone from 11 million to 171 million in a country where it is illegal to do so? Did you know that in Africa, 100 years ago, there were about 12 million people, 1% of the population, 9% of the population that said that they are followers of Christ. That number is now 49% of the population. The number is up here on the board, 680 million people. This is why the Washington Post ran a story in 2014 that said we expect the future to be more religious, not less. Now, it's going to look different in 100 years. Most Christians are going to be in sub-Saharan Africa. The rise of Islam is also happening all over the world. But I want you to understand what's happening. There is a deep, deep need in people's hearts and souls that cannot be answered by secularism. 
You go asking for the deepest longings of your heart to explain them, and you'll get answers saying, you are absolutely worthless to make up your own meaning. Good luck with that. And people don't buy it. Expect religion to grow, not be outdated. As we seek to understand the longings of our heart. Second question that comes up. Says, well, yeah, okay, that's fine. So there's a lot of religious people. People seem to have this deep thirst for meaning. Yes, I get the idea that there's people out there that are trying to make a difference in this world, and they see Christianity as a way to do that. I failed to mention to you that in the last 60 years, there has been a renaissance in philosophy of religion. That's one area that I study. Where at the back of the beginning of the 20th century, it was kind of hard to find a Christian in a philosophy department at any of the major, religion, major uh, colleges in America. But now the heads of the departments of philosophy and religion are often dedicated Christians. And there's a reason for that because of people, some of the brightest people in the world who made a difference in that about 60 years ago. My major professor, Janet Soskis, when I was studying with her at Cambridge, said that she was converted as a teenager because she was going to Cornell and she thought Christians were the dumbest people she had ever met, thought they never would read a book. And then she asked all of her friends, who's the brightest guy in this college? And they said, oh, it's Norman Malcolm. But watch out. He's a dedicated Christian. She began to study with him. That's how she took on Christ. Thomas Nagel the atheist wrote a book called The Last Word, and in that book he said, I want you to understand, I want atheism to be true. And I'm troubled by the fact that the brightest people I know are believers. This idea that it's outdated and that it has nothing to do with using your head doesn't seem to work. And yet you have this other question. Second question, which is, doesn't belief seek faith over facts? I mean, after all, aren't we really just people who are hanging on to pipe dreams? I mean, ghost believing is for children. When adults say they believe in God, are they just hanging on to something they want to be true rather than something that is true? Isn't that what Christianity is all about? Well, I want to answer that in a couple of ways. I want to say that the answer to that is no. And then I want to say maybe. And then I want to say uh, yes. And so do you. Okay, first the no. In my experience, Christianity appears to be one of the most open games in town. I know Christians who disagree about virtually every question that you can think of outside of the central essence of the Christian faith. And they write books about it. And they've made history in trying to promote directions in different directions. And they're all in God's kingdom. You have the central truths of the Christian faith, and then you have room for disagreement. Um, everybody has a central core. Imagine that you decide to get married, and you say, no, let's not be old fuddy-duddies. Let's, uh, let's be the kind of people that don't have to agree on everything to be married. Oh, yes, that's right. That's right. I'm going to look past all of our disagreements, and we'll just hang out in our marriage. That sounds good. Let me tell you something. I don't really believe in this thing called fidelity, and I don't really think that it's bad to like you know stab your neighbor if you disagree with them. Well, that's the end of your relationship. Everybody's got some core things that make you who you are and make, religions me and make your relationships meaningful. Everybody's got them. Christianity has them. You'll find them, for example, in Ephesians chapter 4. You'll have these seven ones. All Christians hang on to these things. And you'll find in any major table of contents, in any book about what Christians believe, you'll find these same basic truths. But I'll tell you something. Christians believe in God's Spirit. But you begin to ask, well, yeah, but what does it mean for the Spirit to dwell in you and to make a difference in the world? There's a lot of disagreement about that. Christians believe that we meet Christ in the Lord's Supper. We start asking questions about, okay, but what does it mean for Christ to be in the Lord's Supper? Well, there's a ton of disagreement about that. We believe that God created the world. Christians can't not believe that. In fact, everything owes its existence to God, for God is radically independent, and all things are radically dependent on God. You can't not know that. But exactly how and exactly when and exactly where all of that creation stuff took place is disagreed among Christians and has been ever since people began to talk about this. I'm telling you that it's one of the most open games in town where people can come and say, we're not all right, but listen to our arguments. And Christians are open to figure out what seems true. But you start asking 
secular humanists or atheists, how open are you on these questions? And what do you think? If there's somebody who doesn't believe in God, there's not even an open question about how could somebody like a spirit exist in the elements. No, you can't even be open to that question, much less how. Well, you begin to ask questions like, well, what does it mean for science not to account for the deepest longings of your heart? Or how do you talk about challenging reigning scientific theories? If you try to do that, you won't get published in any journal. I'm telling you, Christianity is one of the most open games in town. So no, Christians aren't just seeking faith over facts. But second, I want to tell you, well, maybe. Maybe, in the sense that facts by themselves are meaningless. If you find an old coin somewhere in the ground, you pick it up. All you've got is an artifact. That's all you have. It's the story behind it that makes it valuable or meaningful. People don't live and die for facts. They live and die for stories. The stories we apply to those facts. The flag is just a piece of cloth. But you ask people who have died for their country, and they'll tell you it's not the piece of cloth, it's what it stands for. Facts by themselves are meaningless. It's the stories we attach to the fact that are the things we live and die for. And then third, I said the answer is no, and then I said it's maybe, and then I said, well, maybe it's yes, and, and so do you. In the sense that, do we hang on to things we long to believe are true, even when we can't prove them to be true? In 1998, Christian philosopher and apologist William Lane Craig met an atheist philosopher named Peter Atkins. And in that debate, one of the questions Pete Atkins asked was, what, what things can you name that science can't account for? In fact, he actually said, science is omnipotent. That's a religious term. Knows everything. And Pete Atkinson said, science knows everything. Do you deny that science can account for everything? And let's watch this video. Here was uh, William Lane Craig's reply. Thing. Yes, I do deny that science. So, what counted count? Okay. Well, I, have you brought that up in the debate? I've had a number of examples that I was going to give. Uh, I think there are a good number of things that cannot be scientifically proven, but that we're all rational to accept. Let me list. Okay. Let me list five. Logical and mathematical truths cannot be proven by science. Science presupposes logic and math, so that to try to prove them by science would be arguing in a circle. Uh, metaphysical truths like there are other minds other than my own, or that the external world is real, or that the past was not created five minutes ago with an appearance of age, are rational beliefs that cannot be scientifically proven. Ethical beliefs about statements of value uh, are not accessible by the scientific method. You can't show by science whether the Nazi scientists in the camps did anything evil as opposed to the scientists in Western democracies. Aesthetic judgments, number four, cannot be accessed by the scientific method because the beautiful like the good cannot be scientifically proven. And finally, most remarkably, would be science itself. Science cannot be justified by the scientific method. Science is permeated with um, unprovable assumptions. For example, in the special theory of relativity, the whole theory hinges on the assumption that the speed of light is constant in a one-way direction between any two points A and B. But that strictly cannot be proven. We simply have to assume that in order to hold to the theory. Okay, so, so, we got you know, five and slow, yeah. <laughs> okay. so okay. We are, none of these beliefs can be scientifically proven, and yet they are accepted by all of us, and we're right. Now, the, the point of this video is not to somehow make light or make fun of the question itself or the brilliance of the man asking the question. It's to say, once you commit yourself to the idea of, I have figured out what gives me the answers to all the questions of my life, you've gone away from science, now you've adopted what we call a religion. And the problem is science can't answer the deepest longings of your heart. It can't answer what is good or what is bad. It can't tell you what is beautiful. It can't tell you, uh, for example, whether or not all the assumptions that are baked in to the method itself are in fact verifiable. It, it can't do that. And so you begin searching for something deeper, something that makes sense of your life. Um, 
when um, in 2015, the New York Times ran an op-ed article titled The Enduring Hunt for Personal Value. And just somebody who was listening in, somebody on the internet named KCK wrote in, you know, you have little comments at the bottom. And he said, you're not a unique snowflake. You're not special. You're not just another piece of, de- uh, you're just another piece of decaying matter on the compost pile of this world. Nothing of who you are and what you will do in the short time you're here will matter. Everything short of that realization is vanity. So celebrate life in every moment. Admire its wonders and love without reservation. Do you realize that 90% of that quote is exactly what secular humanism, materialism gives you? You're nothing. Your object value is nothing. The meaning you contribute to the world is nothing. And then he adds a sentence with no foundation whatsoever. Therefore, you ought to think that life is celebratory, that the wonders of creation are valuable, and that love is something you ought to pursue. Why should love be considered something of value? Why should life be something to celebrate? Why should wonders be admired? How can you tell others what they ought to do in a world that gives you no oughts? It doesn't work. Everyone operates with a system of beliefs, a faith, if you will, in something that comes before all facts. The question is, which one has the greatest explanatory scope that makes sense of the longings of your heart and the facts you see on the ground? Number three, isn't the existence of pain, evil, and suffering a slam dunk case against the existence of an all-powerful God? I will tell you very quickly, philosophically, the answer is no. In fact, in most philosophy departments, they will tell you this on the front end. It's hardly even a matter of debate anymore, thanks to a Christian philosopher who made the clear case that if it is possible, even possible, for existence, for evil to exist for any possible purpose within a wider scope of God's love, then it's not incompatible for evil to exist with the existence of a loving God. And that's been considered to be true. But that's not where most of us live. Most of us live at the emotional level. Maybe you felt it. Maybe you've seen somebody hurt and you've had the, you thought, if I had the power to stop it hurting, I would do so. I mean, a good God wouldn't let anybody hurt. Well... What about the dentist? C.S. Lewis has this great line. He says, if somebody says, no one who wishes my good could possibly encourage, endorse, or take part in my pain, C.S. Lewis said, well, then you've never been to the dentist. Sometimes pain, even great pain, is on the path to healing. Sometimes real difficulties in our life is what has helped us reach some great successes in our life. Sometimes some pain is not only important and valuable, but necessary. I touch a hot stove and that keeps me from burning off my hand. And when it comes to really big problems, what Marilyn McCord Adams calls horrendous evils, I think we have three replies. First, the Christian might say that in order to see the whole picture, you have to be in an adequate position to judge the reasonableness of the particulars. If I see someone getting cut open on a table, I might want to rush in and stop it. But when it's explained to me that he's in surgery and that this is to help him, it changes my frame of reference. And I'm not in a position to say with certainty that I know or even understand some of the most devastating stories of loss in the world. But I'm unable to say conclusively that there's no justifiable reason to allow it. I'm not in a position to be able to make that claim. The second is that the Christian offers a story to come up with some explanation to do with that. By the way, how do you know something is evil? By what standard do you use? And can you talk about its origins or hope for its conclusion or why anybody should suffer with others who are going through it? Explanatory scope in a world of uncertainty. The problem of evil cries out for an explanation for which naturalism can't provide a solution because nature is part of the problem. And then finally, hasn't religion done more bad than good? 
I mean, you're always seeing stories. You hear about Christianity. What about the Salem witch trials and the Crusades and the Inquisition? Who wants to be part of something and somebody that does something like that? Can I start with some stories you may not be aware of? Did you know that in the ancient Roman world, the idea of giving your goods to those in need or creating places to help those who are hurting was a thing? In fact, the only thing close to like a hospital was something set up to help slaves get better or military people get better so they could go back into the fields or go back on the battlefield. It was a Christian, St. Ephraim the Syrian, who set up one hospital in the plague-ravaged city of Edessa. And then you have Basil the Great, who set up a hospital with a specialty unit for lepers, whom he cared for with his own hands. The first public hospital in Western Europe was started in Rome by a rich lady who scorned her riches and went out on her, on her own to find hurting people to bring them in. All of this happened in the 4th century, right after the Council of Nicaea, where all the bishops were challenged, go back and do good. And they did. It would be four more centuries before the next group started hospitals, and that would be the Arab Muslims, also people of faith. During the Middle Ages, in the middle of the 1500s, there was one source for nearly 2,000 hospitals, and that's the Benedictine monks working from their 37,000 monasteries. And look around today. Is it a coincidence that names like the Salvation Army or the Red Cross or the YMCA or Francis of Assisi and Mother Teresa, Florence Nightingale, Louis Pasteur, the history of modern medicine owes a great debt to the Christian story. In Paris, France, there's a hospital still standing dating back to the 6th century. And at the top, etched in stone, is a Hotel de Eau, which means House of God. Just think about the closest hospital to where you grew up. And tell me if the name Baptist or Methodist, St. Vincent's or Luke's or something similar is attached. And I'm just touching the tip of the iceberg. Yes, Christianity has made a huge difference. You can thank Christians for the end of gladiator combat, for the rise of the abolition movement in England, for the liberation of women in Western culture, for the grounding for crucial arguments for human equality and religious liberty in the Western democracies or for the West's high value of children. You can thank Christians for that. But are there people who have done bad? Yes, most often acting un-Christian. Every group, every story has people who have acted against the wishes and commands of their teaching. But even that needs some explanation. We could talk about how the Salem witch trials, which is used over and over again as the example of how terrible Christianity is, resulted in not millions and millions, but 35 deaths. Or how the minister in town is the one who ended it all. Or how the judge admitted his own duplicity. Or how in 1711, about 15 years after the witch trials, the whole city paid reparations and apologized to the heirs based on their Christian faith. What about the Crusades in Europe and all that happened there? Yes, terribly bad. But I want you to understand that this was all against the wishes of the founder of the religion. But you compare that with Chairman Mao and his cultural revolution, operating under what exactly secularism tells you about the value of human life, and you have 26.3 million people in his lifetime slaughtered. Some say 63 million may have died as a result of him and his policies. And in 1994, the Washington Post said, actually, that number is about 80 million. What about Lenin and Stalin? In Stalin's own life, you had 40 million people die as a result of his leading and teaching. And Solzhenitsyn said 66 million are the result of both of them. What about the Mongolian invasion of northern China, which killed 35 million people, which was 11% of the world population at the time? This idea that religious people are out to do harm and non-religious people are out to do good, it's just not true. My question to you is this. If what's keeping you back from seeking out faith are questions about whether or not Christianity does any good, whether or not people hang on to it for any good reason, whether or not there's a story that's compatible or compelling, may I encourage you to begin the conversation? 
next week, we're going to talk about the longings of your heart. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been enriched. And if you have any questions, any thoughts, any comments, reach out to us at prayers at wschurch.net. God bless you. Tune in next week.